The Lacanian Subject by Bruce Fink. Chapter 5. The Subject and the Other's Desire. In Chapter 1, I spoke in very general terms about our alienation in and by language, language preceding our birth, flowing us into flowing into us via the discourse that surrounds us as infants and children and shaping our wants and fantasies. Without language, there would be no desire as we know it, exhilarating and yet contorted, contradictory, and loath to be satisfied, nor would there be any subject as such. In this chapter, I outline Lacan's view of the advent of the subject in more theoretical terms. I begin with a brief general discussion of the two processes Lacan refers to as alienation and separation, and then go on to describe them more fully in terms of the other's desire. Afterwards, I turn to the operation Lacan regards as a further separation, or a going beyond of separation, the traversing of the fundamental fantasy. Lastly, I illustrate the workings of these three operations in the analytic setting. Alienation and Separation In Lacan's concept of alienation, the two parties involved, the child and the other, are very unevenly matched, and the child almost inevitably loses in the struggle between them. By submitting to the other, the child nevertheless gains something. He or she becomes, in a sense, one of language's subjects, a subject of language or in language. Schematically represented, the child submitting to the other allows the signifier to stand in for him or her. So, other over child. The child coming to be as a divided subject, as illustrated in chapter 4, disappears beneath or behind the signifier S. The child need not absolutely be vanquished in his or her struggle with the other, and psychosis can be understood as a form of victory by the child over the other, the child foregoing his or her advent as a divided subject so as not to submit to the other as language. Freud speaks of the choice of election, of neurosis, and Lacan suggests that a choice of some kind is involved in the child's acceptance to submit to this other, a forced choice, as he calls it, which is something of an oxymoron, the decision not to allow oneself to be subdued by the other entailing the loss of oneself. The latter decision forecloses the possibility of one's advent as a subject. The choice of submission is necessary if one is to come to be as a subject, but it maintains its status as a choice since it is nevertheless possible to refuse subjectivity. Thus, in Lacan's concept of alienation, the child can be understood to in some sense choose to submit to language, to agree to express his or her needs through the distorting medium or straitjacket of language, and to allow him or herself to be represented by words. Lacan's second operation, separation, involves the alienated subject's confrontation with the other, not as language this time, but as desire. The cause of the subject's physical presence in the world was a desire for something, pleasure, revenge, fulfillment, power, immortality, and so on, on the part of the child's parents. One or both of them wanted something, and the child results from that wanting. People's motivations for having children are often very complex and multi-layered, and a child's parents may be very much at odds concerning their motives. One or both parents may have not even wanted to have a child at all, or may have wanted only a child of one particular sex. Whatever their complex motives, they function in a very straightforward way as a cause of the child's physical presence in the world, and their motives continue to act upon the child after his or her birth, being responsible to a great extent for his or her advent as a subject within language. In this sense, the subject is caused by the other's desire. This can be understood as a description of alienation in terms of desire, not simply in terms of language, though they are clearly but though they are clearly but warp and woof of the same fabric. Language being ridden with desire and desire being inconceivable without language, being made of the very stuff of language. If, then, alienation consists in the subject's causation by the other's desire, which preceded his or her birth, by some desire not of the subject's own making, separation consists in the attempt by the alienated subject to come to grips with 
that others desire as it manifests itself in the subject's world. As a child tries to fathom its mother's desire, which is ever in motion, desire being essentially desire for something else, it is forced to come to terms with the fact that it is not her sole interest, in most cases at least, nor her be-all and end-all. There is rarely, if ever, a total mother-child unity whereby the child can fulfill all of the mother's wants in life, and vice versa. Indeed, the mother is often led to momentarily neglect her child's wants precisely because her attention is drawn to other centers of interest. A child is often obliged to await its mother's return, not only because of the demands of reality. She must procure food and other necessities for her child, not to mention the money with which to buy them, but also because of priorities and desires of her own that do not involve her child. The child's unsuccessful attempt to perfectly complement its mother leads to an expulsion of the subject from the position of wanting to be and yet feeling to be the other's sole object of desire. The why and wherefore of this expulsion, this separation, will be described at some length further on. The Vell of Alienation Alienation is not a permanent state of affairs. Rather, it is a process, an operation that takes place at certain times. Rather than trace the historical development of Lacan's concept of alienation throughout his writings, it already appears in his 1936-1949 article on the Mirror Stage. I will present it here as a fully developed notion. We could imagine a concept of alienation involving an either-or, a vel, as the Latin would have it, amounting to an exclusive choice between two parties to be decided by their struggle to the death. Such a vel would allow for the possibility of only one of the parties surviving, but either one, or perhaps all the possibility of neither party surviving. Yet Lacan's vel of alienation always excludes the survival of one and the same party. Lacan's classic is classic example of his vel of alienation in the mugger's threat. Your money or your life. As soon as you hear those words pronounced, it is clear that your money is as good as gone. Should you be so foolhardy as to try to hold on to your money, your trustworthy mugger will unburden you of your life, proceeding no doubt to unburden you of your money as well shortly after. And even if he doesn't, you won't be around to spend it. You will thus, no doubt, be more prudent and hand over your wallet or purse, but you will nonetheless suffer a restriction of your enjoyment insofar as money buys enjoyment. Uncertainty only really mean, uncertainty, uncertainty only really remains around in question around the question of whether you will struggle with him and thus perhaps get yourself killed in the bargain. The parties to the veil of alienation that concern us here are not, however, your money and your life, but the subject and the other, the subject being assigned the losing position, that of money in the previous, previous example, which you had no choice but to lose. In Lacan's veil, the sides are by no means even. In his or her confrontation with the other, the subject immediately drops out of the picture. While alienation is the necessary first step in acceding to subjectivity, this step involves choosing one's own disappearance. Lacan's concept of the subject as manca etre is useful here. The subject fails to come forth as a someone, as a particular being, in the most radical sense. He or she is not. He or she has no being. The subject exists insofar as the word has wrought him or her from nothingness. And he or she can be spoken of, talked about, and discoursed upon, yet remind, yes, rema yet remains beingless. Prior to the onset of alienation, there was not the slightest question of being. It's the subject himself who is not there to begin with. Afterwards, his or her being is strictly potential. Alienation gives rise to a pure possibility of being, a place where one might expect to find a subject, but which nevertheless remains empty. Alienation engenders, in a sense, a place in which it is clear that there is, as of yet, no subject. A place where something is conspicuously lacking. The subject's first guise is this very lack. Lack in Lacan's work has, to a certain extent, an ontological status. It is the first step beyond nothingness. To qualify something as empty is to use a spatial metaphor implying that it could alternatively be full that it has some sort of existence above and beyond its being full or empty. 
A metaphor often used by Lacan is that of something qui, qui manque à sa place, which is out of place, not where it should or it should be or usually is. In other words, something which is missing. Now, for something to be missing, it must first have been pres- present and localized. It must first have had a place, and something only has a place within an ordered system. Space and time coordinates, or a Dewey Decimal Book classification, for example. In other words, within some sort of symbolic structure. Alienation represents the instituting of the symbolic order, which must be realized anew for each new subject, and the subject's assign. Ass- assignation of a place therein, a place he or she does not hold as of yet, but a place designated for him or her and for him or her alone. When Lacan says in Seminar 11 that the subject's being is eclipsed by language, that the subject here slips under or behind the signifier, it is in part because the subject is completely submerged by language, his or her only trace being a place marker or a placeholder in the symbolic order. The process of alienation may, as J.A. Miller suggests, be viewed as yielding the subject as empty set. In other words, a set which has no elements, a symbol which transforms nothingness into something by marking or representing it. Set theory generates its whole domain on the basis of this one symbol and a certain number of axioms. Lacan's subject analogously is grounded in the naming of the void. The signifier is what founds the subject. The signifier is what wields ontic clout, wresting existence from the real that it marks and annuls. What it forges is, however, in no sense substantial or material. The empty set as the subject's placeholder within the symbolic order is not unrelated to the subject's proper name. That name is often selected long before the child's birth, and it inscribes the child in the symbolic. A priori, this name has absolutely nothing to do with the subject. It is as foreign to him or her as any other signifier. But in time, this signifier, more perhaps than any other, will go to the root of his or her being and become inextricably tied to his or her subjectivity. It will become the signifier of his or her very absence as subject, standing in for him or her. Let us now turn to an operation that complements alienation. Desire and lack in separation. Alienation is essentially characterized by a forced choice, which rules out being for the subject, instituting instead the symbolic order and relegating the subject to mere existence as a placeholder therein. Separation, on the other hand, gives rise to being, but that being is of an eminently evanescent and elusive ilk. While alienation is based on a very skewed kind of either-or separation, Um, Sorry, while alienation is based on a very skewed kind of either or, separation is based on a neither nor. Separation implies a situation in which both the subject and the other are excluded. The subject's being must thus come in a sense from outside, from something other than the subject and the other, something that is neither exactly one nor the other. One of the essential ideas involved in separation is that of a juxtaposition, overlapping, or coincidence or coincidence of two lacks. This is not to be confused with a lack of lack, a situation in which lack is lacking. Consider the following passage from Seminar 10. What provokes anxiety? Contrary to what people say, it is neither the rhythm nor the alternation of the mother's presence-absence. What proves this is that the child indulges in repeating presence-absence games, Security of presence is found in the possibility of absence. What is most anxiety-producing for the child is when the relationship through which he comes to be, on the basis of lack which makes him desire, is most perturbed. When there is no possibility of lack, when his mother is constantly on his back. This example fails to conform to Lacan's notion of separation. For the negatives here, the lacks, both apply to the same term. The mother, in other words, the other, the mother, must show some sign of incompleteness, fallibility, or deficiency for separation to obtain and for the subject to come to be as S, that fucking symbol. I don't remember what that symbol means. 
it's the S with like this strikeout. Um, signifier, I think. No, it's not signifier. Whatever, what the fuck ever. It's from a previous chapter. I don't remember. In other words, the mother must demonstrate that she is desiring and thus also a lacking and alienated subject. That she too has submitted to the splitting, barring action of language in order for us to witness the subject's advent. The mother in the above example from seminar 10 monopolizes the field. It is not clear whether she herself has come to be as a divided subject. In separation, we start from a barred other that is a parent who is him or herself divided, who is not always aware, conscious of what he or she wants, unconscious, and whose desire is ambiguous, contradictory, and in constant flux. The subject has, to change metaphors somewhat, gained via alienation a foothold within that divided parent. The subject has lodged his or her lack of being, manque être, in that place where the other was lacking. In separation, the subject attempts to fill the mother's lack, demonstrated by the various manifestations of her desire for something else, with his or her own lack of being, his or her not yet extant self or being. The subject tries to excavate, explore, align, and conjoin those two lacks, seeking out the precise boundaries of the other's lack in order to fill it with him or herself. The child latches onto what is indecipherable in what its parents say, or what its parent says. It is interested in that certain something, which lies in the interval between the parent's words. The child tries to read between the lines to, to decipher why. She says X, but why is she telling me that? What does she want from me? What does she want in general? Children's endless whys are not, to Lacan's mind, the sign of ins of an insatiable curiosity as to how things work, but rather of a concern with where they fit in, what rank they hold, what importance they have to their parents. They are concerned to secure themselves a place, to try to be the object of their parents' desire, to occupy that between the lines space where desire shows its face, words being used in the attempt to express desire and yet ever failing to do so adequately. Lack and desire are coextensive for Lacan. The child devotes considerable effort to filling up the whole of the mother's lack, her whole space of desire. The child wants to be everything to her. Children set themselves the task of excavating the site of their mother's desire, aligning themselves with her every whim and fancy. Her wish is their command, her desire their demand. Their desire is born in complete subordination to hers. Le désir de l'homme, c'est le, le désir de l'autre, Lacan reiterates again and again, taking the second de as a subjective genitive. For the moment, the following translations are possible here. Man's desire is the other's desire. Man's desire is the same as the other's desire. And man desires what the other desires, all of which convey part of the meaning. For man not only desires what the other desires, but he desires it in the same way. In other words, his desire is structured exactly like the other's. Man learns to desire as an other, as if he were some other person. What is posited here is a tendency to totally superimpose the mother's lack and the child's, which is to say that an attempt is made to make their desires completely coincide. This is, however, a chimerical, unrealizable moment. For the fact is that, try as it might, a child can rarely and is rarely allowed or forced to completely monopolize the space of his mother's desire. The child is rarely her only interest, and the two lacks can thus never entirely overlap. The subject is prevented or barred from holding at least part of the space of desire. The introduction of a third term. Separation may be seen here as involving an attempt by the subject to make these two lacks thoroughly coincide, that attempt being abruptly thwarted. We can begin to understand how and why that attempt is thwarted by examining Lacan's reconceptualization of psychosis in Seminar 3. And on a question preliminary to any possible treatment of psychosis in Ecri, for it seems to me that his notion of separation as formulated in 1964 
is in some respects equivalent to what Lacan in 1956 referred to as the operation of the paternal metaphor or paternal function. Psychosis, according to Lacan, results from a child's failure to assimilate a primordial signifier which would otherwise structure the child's symbolic universe. That failure leaving the child unanchored in language without a compass reading on the basis of which to adopt an orientation. A psychotic child may very well assimilate language, but cannot come to be in language in the same way as a neurotic child. Lacking that fundamental anchoring point, the remainder of the signifiers assimilated are condemned to drift. That primordial signifier is instated through the operation of what Lacan calls the paternal metaphor or paternal function. If we hypothesize an initial an initial child-mother unity as a logical, i.e. structural moment, if not a temporal one, the father in a Western nuclear family typically acts in such a way as to disrupt that unity, intervening therein as a third term, often perceived as foreign and even undesirable. The child as yet a sort of undifferentiated bundle of sensations, lacking in sensory motor coordination and all sense of self, is not yet distinguishable from its mother, taking the mother's body as a simple extension of its own, being in kind of direct, unmediated contact with it. And the mother may be inclined to devote virtually all of her attention to the child, anticipate its every need, and make herself 100% accessible and available to the child. In such a situation, the father or some other member of the household or some other interest of the mother's can serve a very specific function, that of annulling the mother-child unity, creating an essential space or gap between mother and child. Should the mother pay no attention to the father or other member of the household, granting him or her no importance, the mother-child relationship may never become triangulated. Or should the father or other member of the household be unconcerned, tacitly allowing the unity to go undisrupted, undis a third term may, may never be introduced. Lacan calls this third term the name of the father, or the father's name, but by formalizing its action in the form of the paternal metaphor or function, he makes it clear that it is not inescapably tied to either biological or de facto fathers, or, for that matter, to their proper names. In Seminar 4, Lacan goes so far as to suggest that the only signifier that is able to serve a paternal function in the case of Freud's little Hans is the signifier horse. Horse is, clearly in Little Hans's case, a name of the father, but certainly not his proper name. It stands in for Hans's father, who is unable to serve a paternal function, because he is incapable of separating his son from his wife. As indicated in Chapter 3, the symbolic order serves to cancel out the real, to transform it into a social, if not socially acceptable, reality. And here the name that serves the paternal function bars and transforms the real, undifferentiated mother-child unity. It bars the child's easy access to pleasurable contact with its mother, requiring it to pursue pleasure through avenues more acceptable to the father figure and or mother, uh, mother with the other, insofar as it is only by her granting of importance to the father that the father can serve that paternal function. In Freudian terms, it is correlated with the reality principle which does not so much negate the aims of the pleasure principle as channel them into socially designated pathways. The paternal function leads to the assimilation or instating of a name, which, as we shall see, is not yet a full-fledged signifier, as it is not displaceable, that neutralizes the other's desire, viewed by Lacan as potentially very dangerous to the child, threatening to engulf it or swallow it up. In a striking passage in seminar... 12. No, sorry, seminar 17. Lacan sums up in very schematic terms what he had been saying for years. The mother's role is her desire, that is, of capital importance. Her desire is not something you can bear easily, as if it were a matter of indifference to you. It always leads to problems. The mother is a big crocodile, and you find yourself in her mouth. You never know what may set her off suddenly making those jaws clamp down. That is the mother's desire. So I tried to explain that there was something reassuring. I am telling you simple things. Indeed, I am improvising. There's a roller, made of stone, of course. 
which is potentially there at the level of the trap and which holds and jams it open. That is what we call the phallus. It is a roller which protects you, should the jaws suddenly close. It should be kept in mind that the French words I am translating by mother's desire, désir de la mère, are inescapably ambiguous, su suggesting both the child's desire for the mother and the mother's desire per se. Whichever, whichever of the two we, cho we choose to dwell on, or whether we prefer to view the situation as a whole, the point is the same. Language protects the child from a potentially dangerous dietic situation, and the way this comes about is through the substitution of a name for the mother's desire. So now there's, there's just like, I don't even know what to call it. But there is name of mother, uh, name of the father written over a line, and under the line is mother's desire. That's on page fifty-seven. Read quite, read quite literally. This kind of formulation suggests that the mother's desires for the father, or whatever may be standing in for him in the family, and that it is thus his name which serves this protective paternal function by naming the mother's desire. Now, a name is, according to Saul Kripke, a rigid designator. In other words, it always and inflexibly designates the same thing. We might refer to a name as a signifier, but only with the caveat that it is an unusual kind of signifier, a primordial signifier. A further step is required for that which replaces or stands in for the mother's desire to function as a full-fledged signifier, it must become part and parcel of the dialectical movement of signifiers, that is, become displaceable, occupying a signifying position that can be filled with a series of different signifiers over time. This requires a further separation of the kind discussed later in this chapter, and it is only that further separation that allows Lacan to refer to the symbolic element operative in the paternal function in a variety of ways. As the father's name, Le nom du père, the father's no saying, le nom du père, or prohibition, the phallus, a signifier of desire, and the signifier of the other's desire. So now it's signifier on top of the line and underneath the line is mother's desire. The substitution implied by the paternal metaphor is only made possible by language. And thus it is only insofar as a second signifier, S2, is instated, the father's name at the outset, and then more generally the signifier of the other's desire, that the mother's desire is retroactively symbolized or transformed into a first signifier. So we've got S2 over S1. S2 here is thus a signifier which plays a very precise role. It symbolizes the mother's desire transforming it into signifiers. By doing so, it creates a rift in the mother-child mother unity and allows the child a space in which to breathe easy, a space of its own. It is through language that a child can attempt to mediate the other's desire, keeping it at bay and symbolizing it ever more completely. While in the 1950s, Lacan spoke of the S2 involved here as the name of the father and in the 1960s as the phallus, we can understand it, must, it most generally as the signifier that comes to signify, to wit, replace, symbolize, symbolize, or neutralize. The other is desire. The symbol Lacan provides us for it, see in particular seminars 6 and 20, is S bracket A bracket, which is usually read the signifier of the lack and the other, but as lack and desire are coextensive can also be read the signifier of the other's desire. The phallic signifier and S bracket A bracket are discussed at length in chapter 8 below. The result of this substitution or metaphor is the advent of the subject as such. The subject is no longer just a potentiality, a mere placeholder in the symbolic, waiting to be filled out, but, is a, but a desiring subject. As we shall see in the discussion of substitutional metaphors in the next chapter, every such metaphor has a similar effect of subjectification. Graphically speaking, separation leads to the subject's expulsion from the other, in which he or she was still nothing but a placeholder. Simplistically described, this can be associated with Freud's view of the outcome of the Oedipus complex, at least for boys. 
whereby the father's castration threats stay away from mom or else eventually bring about a breaking away of the child from the mother. In such a scenario, the child is, in a sense, kicked out of the mother. Now there's a figure, it's figure 5.3, but it's literally just the word child. So I'm not sure if that really is the figure or if there's an issue with my copy of the book because there have been a couple of issues with the figures, but it's on page 58. This logically discernible moment, which is generally quite difficult to isolate at any particular chronological moment of an individual's history, and is likely to require many such moments to come about, each building on the ones before, is the fundamental one in Lacan's metapsychology. All of the crucial elements of his algebra, S1, S2, the S with the strikeout, and A, arising simultaneously here. As S2 is instated, S1 is retroactively determined, S with the strike through is precipitated, and the other's desire takes on a new role, that of object A. Oh, so yeah, so figure 5.3 wasn't showing up properly in my version of this book. <clears throat> object A, the other's desire. In the child's attempt to grasp what remains essentially indecipherable in the other's desire, what Lacan calls the X, the variable, or better, the unknown, the child's own desire is founded. The other's desire begins to function as the cause of the child's desire. That cause is, on the one hand, the other's desire, based on lack for the subject. And here we encounter the other meaning of Lacan's dictum, le désir de l'homme, c'est le désir de l'autre which we can translate here as, for example, man's desires for the other to desire him, or man's, man desires the other's desire for him. His desire's cause can take the form of someone's voice or of a look someone gives him, but its cause also originates in that part of the mother's desire which seems to have nothing to do with him, which takes her away from him, physically or otherwise, leading her to give her precious attention to others. In a sense, we can say that it is the mother's very desirousness that the child finds desirable. In Seminar 8, Lacan points to Alcibiades' fascina Alcibiades's fascination with a certain something in Socrates, which Plato, in, in the Symposium, terms a gelma, a precious, shiny, gleaming something, which is interpreted by Lacan to be Socrates' desire itself. Socrates is desiring or desirousness. This highly valued agelma, inspiring desire in its detectors, can serve us here as an approach to what Lacan calls object A, the cause of desire, which will be discussed at length in chapter 7. The second formulation of Lacan's dictum involving man's desire to be desired by the, desired by the other exposes the other's desire as object A. The child would like to be the sole object of its mother's affections, but her desire almost always goes beyond the child. There is something about her desire which escapes the child, which is beyond its control. A strict identity between the child's desire and hers cannot be maintained. Her desire's independence from her child creates a rift between them, a gap in which her desire, unfathomable to the child, functions in a unique way. This approximate gloss on separation posits that a rift is induced in the hypothetical mother-child unity due to the very nature of desire, and that this rift leads to the advent of object A. Object A can be understood here as the remainder produced when that hypothetical unity breaks down, as a last trace of that unity, a last reminder thereof. By cleaving to that remainder, the split subject, though <clears throat> though expulsed from the other, can sustain the illusion of wholeness. By clinging to object A, the subject is able to ignore his or her division. That is precisely what Lacan means by fantasy, and he formalizes it with the matheme, oh, for fuck's sakes, with an S with the strike through, and then a diamond and an A, which is to be read the dividend subject in relation to object A. <clears throat> oh, the, wait, or the divided subject in relation to object A. 
right? S with the strike through is divided subject. That makes sense. That should be easy to remember, but... It is in the subject's complex relation to object A. Lacan describes this relation as one of envelopment, development, conjunction, disjunction. That he or she achieves a phantasmatic sense of wholeness, completeness, fulfillment, and well-being. When analysands recount fantasies to their analyst, they are informing the analyst about the way in which they want to be related to object A. In other words, the way they would like to be positioned with respect to the other's desire. Object A, as it enters into their fantasies, is an instrument or plaything with which subjects do as they like, manipulating it as it pleases them, orchestrating things in the fantasy scenario in such a way as to derive a maximum of, a maximum of excitement therefrom. Given, however, that the subject casts the other's desire in the role most exciting to the subject, that pleasure may turn to disgust and even to horror there being no guarantee that what is most exciting to the subject is also most pleasurable. That excitement, whether correlated with a conscious feeling of pleasure or pain, is what the French call jouissance. Freud detected it on the face of his rat man, interpreting it as horror at pleasure of his own of which he himself was unaware. And Freud states in no uncertain terms that patients derive a certain satisfaction from their sufferings. This pleasure, this, exci this excitation due to sex, seeing, and or violence, whether positively or negatively viewed by conscience, whether considered innocently pleasurable or disgustingly repulsive, is termed jouissance, and that is what the subject orchestrates for him or herself in fantasy. Jouissance is thus what comes to substitute for the lost mother-child unity, a unity which was perhaps never as united as all that, since it was a unity owing only to the child's sacrifice or foregoing of subjectivity. We can imagine a kind of jouissance before the letter, before the institution of the symbolic order, J1, corresponding to an unmediated relation between mother and child, a real connection between them, which gives way before the signifier, being cancelled out by the operation of the paternal function. Some modicum or portion of that real or sorry, some modicum or portion of that real connection is refound in fantasy, a jouissance after the letter J2, and the subject's relation to the leftover or byproduct of symbolization. Object uh, object A that which is produced as S2 retroactively determines S1 and precipitates out a subject, as we shall see. So now there's um, table 5.1. So in the box, there's J1, an arrow to symbolic, and then an arrow to J2 um, from symbolic. The second order jouissance takes the place of the former wholeness or completeness in fantasy, which stages the second order jouissance, takes the subject beyond his or her nothingness, his or her mere existence as a marker at the level of alienation, and supplies a sense of being. It is thus only through fantasy, made possible by separation, that the subject can procure him or herself some modicum of what Lacan calls being. While existence is granted only through the symbolic order, the alienated subject being assigned a place therein, being is supplied only by cleaving to the real. Thus we see how it is that separation, and neither nor involving the subject and the other, brings forth being, creating a rift in the subject, other, whole. The other's desire escapes the subject, ever seeking as it does something else. Yet the subject is able to cover a remainder thereof by which to sustain him or herself in being, as a being of desire, a desiring being. Object A is the subject's complement, a phantasmatic partner that ever arouses the subject's desire. Separation results in the splitting of the subject into ego and unconscious, and in a corresponding splitting of the other into lacking other, and object A. None of these parties were there at the outset, and yet separation results in a kind of intersection, whereby something of the other, the other's desire in this account, that the subject considers his or her own, essential to his or her existence, is ripped away from the other, 
and retained by the now divided subject in fantasy. Um, there's another figure here, figure 5.4. It's a little hard to describe. Um, so subject has an arrow to the left um, to ego, and then an arrow to the right to the um, divided subject symbol, the S strikeout star. I don't remember that. You know what? It's page 61. It's really hard to explain, so check it out. A further separation, the traversing of fantasy. The notion of separation largely disappears from Lacan's work after 1964, giving way in the late 1960s to a mere elaborate theory of the effect of analysis. By seminars 14 and 15, the term alienation comes to signify both alienation and separation as elaborated in 1960 to 64, and a new dynamic notion is added. La traversée du fantasme, the crossing over, traversal or, tra or traversing of the fundamental fantasy. This reformulation begins, in a sense, with Lacan's elaboration of the notion that the analyst must play the role of object A, the other as desire, not as language. The analyst must steer clear of the role in which analysands often cast him or her, that of an all-knowing and all-seeing other who is the ultimate judge of their value as human beings and the final authority on all questions of truth. The analyst must maneuver away from serving the analysand as an other to Im imitate, to try to be like, to desire like, desire's tendency being to model itself on the other's desire. In short, an other with whom to identify, whose ideals one can adopt, whose views one can make one's own. Instead, the analyst must endeavor to embody desirousness, revealing as few personal likes and dislikes, ideals and opinions as possible, providing the analysand as little concrete information about his or her character, aspirations and tastes as possible, as they all furnish such fertile ground in which identification can take root. Identification with the analyst's ideals and desires is a solution to neurosis advanced by certain analysts of the Anglo-American tradition. The analysand is to take the analyst's strong ego as a model by which to shore up his or her own weak ego. An analysis coming to a successful end if the analysand is able to sufficiently identify with the analyst. In Lacanian psychoanalysis, identification with the analyst is considered a trap, leading the analysand as it does to still more alienation within the other as language and as desire. Maintaining his or her constant enigmatic desire for something else, the Lacanian analyst aims not at modeling the modeling the aims not at modeling the analyst analysand's desire on his or her own, but rather at shaking up the configuration of the analysand's fantasy, changing the subject's relation to the cause of desire, object A. This reconfiguration of fantasy implies a number of different things, the construction in the course of analysis of a new fundamental fantasy, the latter being that which underlies an analysands various individual fantasies and constitutes the subject's most profound relation to the other's desire. The traversing of the square and the schema of the split subject provided in chapter 4 to the lower left-hand corner and a crossing over of positions within the fundamental fantasy whereby the divided subject assumes the place of the cause, in other words, subjectifies the traumatic cause of his or her own advent as subject coming to be in that place where the other's desire, a foreign alien desire, had been. The traversing of fantasy involves the subject's assumption of a new position with respect to the other as language, and the other as desire. A move is made to invest or inhabit that which brought him or her into existence as split subject, to become that which caused him or her. There where it... The other's discourse, written with the other's desire, was the subject is able to say I, not it happened to me, or they did this to me, 
or fate had it in store for me, but I was, I did, I saw, I cried out. This further separation consists in the temporally paradoxical move by the alienated subject to become his or her own cause, to come to be a subject in the place of the cause. The foreign cause, that other desire that brought one into the world, is internalized, in a sense, taken responsibility for, assumed in the sense of the French word, assomption, subjectified, made one's own. If we think of trauma as the child's encounter with the other's desire, and so many of Freud's cases support this view, consider, to cite but one example, little Hans's traumatic encounter with his mother's desire, trauma functions as the child's cause, the cause of his or her advent as subject, and of the position the child adopts as subject in relation to the other's desire. The encounter with the other's desire constitutes a traumatic experience of pleasure, pain, or jouissance, which Freud describes as a sexual uber, a sexual overload, the subject coming to be as a defense against that traumatic experience. The traversing of fantasy is the process by which the subject's subject subjectifies trauma, takes the traumatic event upon him or herself, and assumes responsibility for that jouissance. Subjectifying the cause, a temporal conundrum. Temporally speaking, this operation of putting the I back in the traumatic cause is paradoxical. Was there subjective involvement at the moments of trauma that the subject must come to recognize and take responsibility for? Yes, in some sense. And yet subjective involvement seems to be brought about after the fact. Such a view necessarily contradicts the timeline of classical logic, whereby effect follows cause in a nice, orderly fashion. Separation nevertheless obeys the workings of the signifier, whereby the effect of the first word in a sentence can be brought out only after the last has been heard or read, and whereby its meaning is only constituted retroactively by semantic context provided after its utterance, its full meaning being an historical product. Just as Plato's dialogues take on a first meaning for students new to philosophy, Acquiring multiple meanings as they deepen their study of them, Plato's symposium has been shown to mean something else since Lacan's reading of it in Seminar 8, and will continue to take on new meanings as it is interpreted and reinterpreted in the centuries and millennia to come. Meaning is not created instantaneously, but only ex post facto, after the event in question, such as the temporal logic and a thema to classical logic at work in psychoanalytic processes and theory. Lacan never pinpoints the subject's chronological appearance in the, on the scene. He or she is always either about to arrive, is on the verge of arriving, or will have already arrived by some later moment in time. Lacan uses the equivocal French imperfect tense to illustrate the subject's temporal status. He gives us an example the sentence deux secondes plus tard, la bombe éclatait, which can either mean two seconds later the bomb exploded or the bomb would have gone off two seconds later, there being an implicit if and or but, and it would have gone off two seconds later if the fuse had not been cut. A similar ambiguity is suggested by the following English wording, the bomb was to go off two seconds later. Applied to the subject, the French imperfect tense leaves us uncertain as to whether the subject has emerged or not. His or her ever so fleeting existence remains in suspense or in abeyance. Here there seems to be no way of really determining whether the subject has been or not. Lacan more commonly uses the future interior, also known as the future perfect, in, dis in discussing the subject's temporal status. By the time you get back, I will have already left. Such a statement tells us that at a certain future moment, something will have already taken place, without specifying exactly when. This grammatical tense is related to Freud's nachtraglichkeit, deferred action, retroaction, or ex post facto action. A first event, E1, occurs, but does not bear fruit until a second event, E2, occurs. 
retroactively E1 is constituted, for example, as a trauma. In other words, it takes on the significance of a trauma, T. It becomes to, it comes to signify something that in no way that it in no way signified before. Its meaning and efficacy have changed. Figure five point six, E one arrow to E two, and then off to the side, there is um, E one with an arrow to E two, and then an arrow from E two going over to E one, and E1 is over T, which has signification in brackets. You probably want to look at that. It's uh, page 64. In the statement, by the time you get back, I will have already left. My departure is retroactively determined as prior. Without your return, it would have no such status. It takes two moments to create a before and after. The signification of the first moment changes in accordance with what comes afterwards. Similarly, a first signifier does not, as we shall see below, suffice to create an effect of subjectification until a second signifier has appeared on the scene. A relation between two signifiers proves to us that a subject has passed that way, and yet we can in no sense pinpoint the subject in either time or space. This will be developed further in the next chapter. Lacan's article, Logical Time and the Assertion of Anticipated Certainty, sets out to pinpoint the emergence of the subject in a very precise situation, with a series of explicit constraints. The moments elaborated in that paper, the instant of the glance, the time for comprehending, and the moment of concluding, were later referred by Lacan to the moments of the analytic process itself. Just as the time for comprehending is indeterminate for an outsider, in the three-prisoner problem, Expounded in that article, the time necessary for comprehending an analysis is indeterminate. In other words, it is not calculable a priori. Yet in associating the end of analysis with a prisoner's moment of concluding, Lacan suggests a final moment of subjectification that can be forced to occur through a propitious combination of logical and or analytic conditions. Thus, while seemingly forever suspended in a future anterior, Lacan nevertheless holds out for us the prospect of a subjectification of the cause at a logically specific but chronometrically incalculable moment. We may, in a sense, think of alienation as opening up that possibility, and of this further separation as marking the end of the process. Nevertheless, as we shall see, separation can be fostered in certain situations, for example at the moment of the cut or scansion of an analytic session a moment which is both logical and chronological. The traversing of fantasy can, not surprisingly, also be formulated in terms of increasing signif sig signifierization, a turning into signifiers, of the other's desire, insofar as the subject finds in this further separation a new position in relation to object A, the other's desire. The other's desire is no longer simply named, as it was through the... Uh, as it was through the action of the paternal metaphor. When the cause is subjectified, the other's desire is simultaneously fully brought into the movement of signifiers, and it is at that point, as we can see in Lacan's discussion of Hamlet in Seminar 6, that the subject finally gains access to the signifier of the other's desire. In other words, whereas the other's desire had simply been named through separation, that name was fixed, static, and thing-like in its unchanging effect rigid in its limited power of designation. In neurosis, the name generally remains to be adequately separated from the other's desire. The name is not the death of the thing, the signifier is. As long as a rigid connection subsists between the other's desire and a name of the father, the subject is unable to act. Hamlet, according to Lacan, has no access to the phallic signifier prior to his duel with Laertes at the end of Shakespeare's play and that is why he is incapable of taking any action. It is only during the duel that he is able to discern the phallus behind the king, to realize that the king is but a stand-in for the phallus, the phallus being the signifier of desire, i.e. of the other's desire, and can be struck without throwing everything into question. Until Hamlet could finally dissociate the king and the phallus, the king is a thing of nothing, 
action was impossible, for to take revenge on the king would have threatened to make Hamlet's whole world collapse. It is only when the king, the object of the queen's desire, is signifierized that a power can be discerned beyond the king, a legitimacy or authority that is not embodied in the king alone, but subsists in the symbolic order beyond the king, above the king. The name of the other's desire must be set into motion. From the mother's partner, to teacher, to school, to police officer, to civil law, to religion, to moral law, and so on, and give way before the signifier of the other's desire, if subjectification is to take place. That is, if the subject is to become the other's desire, leaving the signifier to its own devices. In that sense, traversing fantasy entails a separation from language itself, a separation of the subject, who will have become the cause, from his or her own discourse about his or her problem with the other's desire, inability to deal with the lack detected in the other, lack of success in maintaining the right distance from in relation to the other, and so on. Neurosis is maintained in discourse, and we see in Lacan's notion of traversing fantasy the suggestion of a kind of beyond of neurosis, in which the subject is able to act, as cause, as desirousness, and is at least momentarily out of discourse, split off from discourse, free from the weight of the other. This is not the freedom of the psychotic this is not the freedom of the psychotic Lacan mentions in his early paper, Aggressivity in Psychoanalysis. It is not a freedom before the letter, but after it. Alienation, separation, and the traversing of fantasy in the analytic setting. <clears throat> Imagine for a moment an analysand ensconced upon the analyst's couch, talking about his or her dream from the night before, filling the room with his or her discourse, hoping that it will be interesting and satisfying to the analyst, thus in a fantasy mode, being suddenly interrupted with word uttered by the, ana the analyst, not by the other of knowledge, to whom that discourse was in some sense addressed, a word which the analysand may have hurriedly glossed over or thought of no importance or interest either to him or herself or to the analyst. Analysians often tailor their discourse due to transference love, hoping to say what their analysts want them to say, what they think their analysts want to hear, and until such an interruption comes, whether with a cough, a grunt, a word, or the termination of the session, they can go on believing that they are achieving their purpose. Such interruptions often serve to jolt analysians, suddenly bringing them back to the realization that they know not what their analysts want or mean, that the latter are looking for something else in their discourse than what the analysians intended, that they want something else from it, something more. It is in that sense that the Lacanian practice of punctuating and scan scanning, scanning the analysians' discourse serves to, dis to disconnect the analysand therefrom, confronting the analysand with the enigma of the analyst's desire. It is insofar as that desire remains enigmatic, never being precisely where the analysand believes it is, and analysands devote considerable effort to divining that desire, that the analysand's fantasy is repeatedly shaken up in the analytic situation. The other's desire in the guise of object A is never precisely where the, anal the analysand thinks it is, or wants it to be in his or her fantasy. The analyst serving as a sham or make-believe object A, as a stand-in for the, as a stand-in for, or semblance of object A, introduces a further gap between. The. Scene I already forgot, the S with the slash through. It's like D something symbol and A. Disrupting the fantasized relationship. The analyst makes that relationship untenable, inducing a change therein. Alienation and separation are involved at all times in the analytic situation. The analysand alienating him or herself as he or she tries to speak coherently. In other words, in a way which will make sense to the analyst. The analyst taken here by the analysand to be the locus of all meaning. The other that knows the meaning of all utterances. In the attempt to make sense, the analysand slips away or fades behind the words he or she says. 
because of the very nature of language. Those words always and inescapably say more or less than the analysis consciously intends to say in selecting them. Meaning is always ambiguous, polyvalent, betraying something one wanted to remain hidden, hiding something one intended to express. This attempt to make sense situates the analysand in the register of the other as meaning. The analysand fades behind a discourse whose true meaning can only be determined and judged by the other, whether parent, analyst, or god. That kind of alienation is unavoidable and is not unlike alienation as understood by Marxists and critical theorists condemned in Lacanian analysis. Nevertheless, the analyst is enjoined not to indefinitely foster this kind of alienation, though the analyst, in his or her work with neurotics, attempts to bring into focus the analysand's relation to the other, clearing away in the process the interference stemming from the analysand's imaginary relations with others like him or herself. See chapter 7 below. That is by no means the end of the process and could lead, if left at that, to a kind of solution a la American ego psychology, the analysand identifying with the analyst as other. The Lacanian analyst adopts a discourse radically different from that of the analysand, a discourse of separation. If the analyst offers up something along the lines of meaning to the analysand, he or she nevertheless aims at something capable of exploding the analysis. Exploding the analyst provides the meaning of the analysand's discourse matrix by speaking equivocally at several levels at once, using terms which lead in a number of different directions. By intima intimating several, if not a never-ending, panorama of successive meanings, the register of meaning is itself problematized. As the analysand attempts to fathom the import of the analyst's oracular speech, his or her polyvalent words, or the reason why he or she terminated the session at that precise moment, the analysand is separated from meaning and confronted with the enigma of the analyst's desire. That enigma has an effect on the analysand's deep-rooted fantasy relation to the other's desire. While the fundamental rule of free association requires the analysand try to ever further articulate, put into words, symbolize, signifier signifierize that relation to the other's desire, the analyst's action serves to separate the subject to an ever greater extent from the very discourse he or she is required to forge about it. One is the subject of a particular fate, a fate one has not chosen, but which, however random or accidental it may seem at the outset, one must nevertheless subjectify. One must, in Freud's view, become its subject. Primal repression is, in, <clears throat> in a sense, the roll of the dice at the beginning of one's universe that creates a split and sets the structure in motion. An individual has to come to grips with that random toss, that particular configuration of his or her parents' desire, and somehow become its subject. Woe es war sol ik worden. I must come to be where foreign forces, the other is language and the other is desire, once dominated. I must subjectify that otherness. It is for this reason that we can say that the Lacanian subject is ethically motivated, based as it is on this Freudian injunction so often repeated in Lacan's work. Freud's injunction is inherently paradoxical, enjoining us at it as it does, to put the I back in the cause, to become our own cause. But instead of dismissing this paradox, Lacan attempts to theorize the movement implied therein and find techniques by which to induce it. The eye is not already in the unconscious. It may be everywhere presupposed there, but it has to be made to appear. It may always already be there in some sense, but the essential clinical task is to make it appear there where it was.